Hello, Christopher. <laughs> What's up, man? How are you doing? Is that your legal birth given yeah. name? Yes, it is. <laughs> My best friend's name's Jeremy, and I've always thought his legal name is Jeremiah, but no, it's Jeremy. Oh, so. huh. interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's. Yeah, I guess you could also name your kid Chris and not have a Christopher as the full thing. I've never thought about that, actually. But I guess anybody that spells it like K R I S maybe is doesn't have the full thing. I don't know. I guess as a parent, you could really just do whatever you want. You can mess with your kids as much as you want. <laughs> We're trying to uh, pick baby names for our baby coming in October. You got to make sure the, the gem name on Ruby Gems isn't taken. <laughs> right. Or the domain's not taken. <laughs> uh, we have this app we use. I don't even know the name of it. Uh, Shannon sends it to me. We we use it last time. And it's like Tinder for baby names. So <laughs> you swipe left and right based off like, I like this name or I don't. And then it tells you if you're a match on a name. That's funny. It's kind of fun. How does it do the matching? Uh, Just kind of learns, I guess, what it, you like. So it gives you names. And then okay. uh, I guess there's just like a database of names. And so uh, I really don't know. I guess it's a limited database or like it probably looks at uh, what she said yes to and tries to throw it in every now and then or what. But. Huh. That's funny. Oh, it's because you both use it and it tries to find a match between you guys. Yeah. I see. Okay. Okay. That's cool. That's yeah. a neat idea. Yeah. It's cool. Uh, I started uh i started dating and got married after or excuse me way before the tinder and all that came out so i feel like i finally like get to live that like swipe left swipe right <laughs> life you've had fear of missing out for <laughs> so long <laughs> yeah so that's funny <laughs> uh so we had talked about maybe chatting about the github stuff we didn't really talk about that last week yeah, I mean, I think that was pretty big news that shook, shook the uh, whole developer community. I think it's a good thing. You know, a lot of people, I think, were concerned about direction. But from what we've seen from Microsoft with, like, my favorite thing being, like, the Linux subsystem, they seem to be making some good strides in open source and whatever. I don't know. What do you think? So I'm, I'm very pro-Microsoft. Uh, as an Apple fanboy, I'm very pro Microsoft. <laughs> um, the I was really I was really impressed when they brought or when they introduced .NET Core and they started bringing .NET and stuff to the Mac. Oh yeah, when they open sourced that, I forgot all about that. Yeah, it's uh, a big deal. Yeah, and they started putting like tons of stuff on GitHub. So I mean, it's kind of like a I don't know. I guess it makes sense, like. I mean, they were the, they at the time of acquisition are the biggest user of GitHub. That's pretty pretty huge. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I don't know how many people realize that. Like, it's not like Microsoft's like, oh, we just started doing a little bit of open source. Let's buy GitHub. <laughs> it's like we yeah. we've gone all in on this. So I think it's cool. I also it's kind of an aside, but I really like the CEO. I think they're doing really cool stuff with like hardware too. So. I don't know. Microsoft's a lot different. To Get me. it. Um, what's his name? The CEO, Nat. Uh, I don't remember his last name. I would. I would be embarrassed to try and pronounce it. I'm really but, that. But yeah, his uh, his blog post or whatever about the acquisition was really good. I thought it sounded exactly in line with what I would want. You know, someone taking over to do. And the the GitHub guys and everything like their team deserves. A good exit at this point they've been working on that for ages and nice to be able to for them i'm sure cash out and enjoy some of the benefits of having built such a giant business yeah no, years. and like if somebody was like hey we want to write you a check for what what was it like seven and a half billion dollars <laughs> yeah if somebody's like we want to write you a check for that i'd be like hmm, let me think about it like yeah, yeah. Hell yeah. Come You're on. You're like, I don't know if that'll pay for my kids' uh, college. <laughs> so 
maybe if you could do double that, it'd be fine. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, it's not like it was like, it was with a company who has recently, especially a really like proven track record. Like everybody's probably heard of Microsoft. Like, it's not like it's just some <laughs> company who you well, it's, don't it's know. Just a lot of, it's a lot of old, um, just bad reputation from back in the day when they weren't at all supporting uh, any openness really. And everything was really proprietary that, that like feeling still exists and they're actively really working hard to get past that and make some cool stuff. And they're, they're I think they're really succeeding and, you know, while every time I log into windows and it's got to install like five hours worth of updates, um, I still get frustrated with that, but like, you know, it makes like running Rails and Ruby and doing development on Windows really easy if you use like the Linux subsystem. And that's like, they literally went and like converted all of Linux to like native Windows code, which is insane. That's so cool. Yeah. I like discussion on Apple aside, like I've been. I don't know. Apple could be like, Hey, we've made a lawnmower and like, I'm allergic to grass. And I'd be like, I got to buy this lawnmower and start cutting my grass. <laughs> but like yeah. recently I've really considered like trying out a, a PC again. Like with interesting Linux subsystem. I think the surface is just so cool. Hardware. It definitely seems to be a really good, you know, hardware product. And uh, I use Apple for everything, but man, I look at my MacBook and, I got lucky by getting my battery replaced or I went in for a battery replacement and they gave me a whole new 2015 MacBook. And so I got to skip the, you know, buying one of the new touch bar ones and all their problems. And, you know, the operating system updates and whatever are minor these days. They're not doing a lot of new innovative stuff at Apple as compared to where they used to be. And Microsoft seems to be really pushing in comparison. So, yeah, I mean, they they definitely seem to be more attractive. And when Linux is that easily accessible, you get, for the most part, um, aside from homebrew, you know, for the most part, you still get to install things just as easily and, you know, work with everything that you're used to. So, I don't know. It's considered, or, or like a, thing to definitely consider next next machine you need to buy yeah like i was thinking about earlier i tweeted earlier today like i really miss my macbook air that was like my favorite computer i've ever owned yeah i've still got one and i love how light it is and everything it's fantastic yeah. um I, yeah. I just i just have a hard time coding on a screen like that isn't like giant you know like i just want to see so much so many tabs of code open and terminals and whatever. So like a 15 inch is where I have to be for the most part for coding, but like for regular use, MacBook air all day. I love the size of that. It's so great. See, I can do the coding on the small screen. I, I have been so spoiled with retina in 4k that like, if I wanted to use a MacBook air, I'd be like, I could use it. Don't be wrong. But, it's an adjustment. Yeah. Whenever I open mine, I'm like, man, shit's blurry. <laughs> it's like, you know, not retina. And it's just, you can see every pixel and it's kind of funny how, yeah, like my main monitors are 4k and, um, you know, it's impossible to go back to those older displays. It's really tough. <laughs> Yeah, you. Uh, if you go to like Mac Rumors and you look on the buyer's guide, everything right now is don't buy except <laughs> for the iMac Pro because it was like just released. Yeah, that's right. I'm disappointed they never shipped their um, wireless charging pad and stuff that yeah. was supposed to be this quarter, you know? We have an Ikea. We have Ikea lamps on our side tables and they're like the charging ones. And like, honest to God my phone charges 40% of the time because like, I'll like start falling asleep on my phone, like just throw it over there thinking like, Oh, it's wireless. It'll just like pick up. But there's such a small radius on that. Oh yeah. Parking block. Like I, right before we started, like my phone was like 30%. I like, I haven't even been on my phone today. 
there was those ones because the iPhone doesn't have like the magnets that align it or whatever, but there were the ones that I don't know. Android phones uh, had some magnets that you drop it on and it would just like shift it a little bit so that it would start charging. But yeah, that's, that's definitely annoying if you drop it. I've done that before. I have like a random one I've bought off of Amazon and dropped my phone on there when I was tired. And then like I wake up in the morning and it's like 20% battery left and I'm like, dang it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not like I work at home, so it's not like I can't just charge it, but it's still right. Like I don't, you don't use wanna... my phone. Just charge while I sleep. Yeah. You don't want to worry about it during the day. Um, but I've heard that you've had a fun week with, uh, you know, some, some projects of yours. Yeah, this was in terms of running software, the worst week of my life. <laughs> so this is going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, so my wife and my child left for San Diego on Friday. And so I stayed home and. I was like, man, it's got the best weekend, the best week, like just coding, you know, work on all the like side stuff I want to do. Um, and so Saturday I was working on it's one of my like side projects and somebody I do work for messaged me. He's like, hey, you know, we made some updates. Have you merged them in? And I was like, oh, no, I haven't. And when he says like we've made some updates, he means like I've made some updates because I'm the only one that works on this project now. And so I was like, no, I'll just merge them in real quick. He said, hey, didn't you say there'd be some downtime? I was like, oh, no, you know, we're just deploying to Heroku. It should only take like a few seconds. I just have to run a migration right after uh, I deploy. And so I deployed, ran the migration. I was like, cool. So I just closed everything out and went back to just coding. And then all of a sudden, my Slack starts blowing up. And it's like, hey, we are in crisis. And I was like, what does that mean? So this project I work on generates XML feeds and XML feeds have uh, different types of readers, things like that. Uh, so one of, I'm, I'm being very vague here, but one of the, uh, one of, one of the apps that a lot of people use started just blowing up and one person got up to like 1800 notifications on their phone <laughs> and alongside these notifications things download and so people's phones are like draining battery uh <laughs> it's probably safe to say i i don't even want to guess to make the number of things that messed up the number of notifications that caused or downloads to occur but it was a massive problem. So I'm like shutting down, like trying to figure out what happened. And what happened was in this feed or in these feeds, there are IDs and the IDs changed. And so the reason that happened is because I added a new column in the database and then used like friendly ID to match to it. But when I deployed, everything was, all those like slug columns were null. So it fell back to the actual like ID of the record. And that was because you fixed that in the migration, but it didn't run during the deploy. Or is that the case? I don't usually do like data migrations in database migrations. And so. Okay. Um, so either, either way. I'd have been screwed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what we talked about hindsight. I was like, Hey, even the way I would have done this would have caused this problem. Um, it was one of those situations where you need like a two stage rollout of that feature so that you can get everything ready to use it. And then, you know, to actually switch over to whatever new thing that you've added um, would have made it fine, I guess. But <laughs> this was one, of, and those are like hard to think about, especially when you have, you don't control the clients, right? So, like, right. unlike Slack, well, I guess. Slack's main app, not their API, but you know, like their main thing is they control the client, they control the server. So if anything really goes wrong, like it's not a huge deal. But in your case, you had 
lots and lots of different clients that you didn't have any control over. And so if you do anything wrong like that, things go bad fast. Yep. And a couple of the, luckily um, the people I do work with know the people who make the clients, um, mm -hmm. kind of the more popular clients. So I was able to actually like talk to those people and figure out like what I did wrong. But literally that was at like six, six thirty Saturday night and like 11 o'clock. I was just like still sitting at my computer, just like head down, like <laughs> so upset. So but, how, how long did it take you to, you know, recognize something was wrong and then get a fix live? Um, I was able to recognize something was wrong within, well, once I got the Slack notification from somebody, um, one of the, uh, from the client, they were, I was able to dig in and I just rolled back and rolling back, you know, got mm -hmm. the data back, but it was too late because that bad feed was already out in the world. So, right. And it was uh, kind of cached out there, I imagine. Yeah. And one of, you know, one of the clients was able to, I keep using the word client, one of the applications, one of the consumers of the XML feed, uh, was it they were able to fix it by just ignoring like anything from the last hour. So that yeah. helped. But uh, yeah, that obviously for after like, after I was able to like pull myself together, which was like Sunday night, it was, I had a really bad Saturday night, Sunday. Uh, it led me thinking about how I could have solved that. And specifically in my case of um, Heroku, I've never tried this outside of Heroku. In uh, your app.json file, I think it is. No, your proc file. Just in your proc file, you can set commands to run on release. Mm -hmm. um, I actually learned about that at my new job. And so... That led me to, let me see if I have that gem handy. I found uh, essentially like a data migration gem. Hmm. And so it'll run like, it'll run like database migrations. So they have like ups and downs. So I'm thinking anytime I need to, anytime I don't necessarily want to do like a two phase rollout in the future, maybe using something like that to say, Hey, every time we deploy, see if there's any data migrations that you need to run, run those before we do the release. Gotcha. Yeah. What's the name of that gem? Uh, it's called data migrate, data dash migrate. Data migrate. I think I've checked that one out before. Sounds cool though. Maybe it'll be good for a screencast. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, so um yeah you can do like rate do migrate up with data so cool yeah this looks nice yeah it was cool um you know hindsight's 2020 uh <laughs> yeah i wish i'd had something like that before but i guess yeah. this this is my one like everybody has that like one story right mm -hmm. like drop to production database or something like that and i i'm hoping this is just my one story but yeah it was <laughs> it was eventful yeah i mean i think in my in my first rails job my actual first rails job i had done some like freelance work uh, before that but um one time we had a client that their app was i don't even remember the details of it but it was like a sort of like a e-commerce store and all the products were synced from some third party, which is really common. Like if you're, if you sell t-shirts or something, like you can get a feed from Printful of all the available t-shirts and then just drop it in your Shopify store or whatever. Um, and I don't remember what I was doing, but we were, we were adding something or whatever to it, changing some things around. And like there was a cron job, you know, that ran from, uh, that ran every night and it would import um, all the updates from the third party. And I remember 
in the middle of the day, I'm like working on something and, you know, I need to in development, like also import that stuff so I can make sure my changes work and whatever. And, uh, I don't remember how it happened anymore, but I dropped the production database and, and, uh, the whole site went down and everything. And I didn't really know how to restore it either. Cause this was like my first job and everything, but luckily like I'm, we got really lucky because, you know, that was imported from another service. So we could just run the import again and that would be fine. So it's pretty much just like, where's the cron job? Let's copy and paste that command and run it. And we should be okay. And I think that's for the most part how we fixed it. But yeah, that was uh, one of the most stressful days I've ever had as a programmer. You know, like when the whole production site just disappears, uh, things things feel a little scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's no doubt. So, and it, you know, it's it's those things that I think it comes with. Um, you know, as, as you learn anything really like if you're driving or whatever, you end up getting comfortable at, at some point. And then you always have one of those moments that really like gut checks you and is like, Hey, you need to, you remember like, can't take it too easy. You got to remember to stay aware and whatever. And those, those serve for some pretty long-term th- feelings of awareness when you're, when you're coding and you, you know, drop the production database and same kind of thing goes if you like accidentally run a stoplight or some or stop sign or whatever like you're gonna freak out for a while and pay a lot closer attention to what you're working on (laughs) i'm glad you said that because that reminds me um i just pulled it up i bought this book towards the end of may i've been reading it's called the checklist manifesto i've heard of that i haven't read it but i have heard of that it's really good so far. It's um, the author is a doctor and talks about, you know, how complex the medical profession is. He he relates it to other professions, but um, how kind of like you said, like we get so comfortable doing things like if, but if we miss a step and he talks about this, like in the medical profession, like if you miss a step, it could cause a lot of problems. And so I was like, well, I've been reading this book. I'm like, I mean, software is complex, but how could I make a checklist for that? And then this happened. And so like the first thing I did was in GitHub, I put in like a pull request template and it's a checklist of all the things I have to check off before I merge in. Well, that's great. That's a great idea. Yeah. They've got some nice little template things in um, GitHub, like for even you can template your replies, which is cool too. If they're if you got common ones, it's a great little feature to take more advantage of because I don't use that really right now, but it's a something I should do. Yeah, it was just one of those gut check moments. I was like, maybe this is a good place for a checklist. And like uh one of one of the items is does this require data migrations? Are they set up underneath that? Did you run them underneath that? Are you sure? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I like the are you sure? <laughs> That's good. But yeah, that's my that's my wild week. So do you think that'll change any other um practices that you do regularly? Um I yes. Makes me want to be more aware of uh having well, I guess it makes me want to have better testing environments. Mm-hmm. Like I wasn't really testing those feeds before. And so now um, now I want to actually like make sure that when I do things, you know, data doesn't change. And if it does, I expect it. So I don't know if that's like better testing practices, um, or what that entails, but it definitely has me just wanting to be, I guess, more QA. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. cause I've, I've been so comfortable at least in this project, like we've been working on it for a long time. So just pushing things out and they work. So I got kind of lax and so. It's a good excuse uh, to begin a staging environment for sure. And then, you know, rolling things out, double checking with your checklist of like, you know, double check this feed and that feed and whatever. And that that's a good idea for sure. It can be hard, like a lot of things where, you know, you don't necessarily know you now know how much of those clients depend upon this certain thing. 
And so you can add that test or check now, but you maybe couldn't have thought of how important it was until you recognized how big of an issue it was. And so that's, that's going to be an important thing I imagine too. Yeah. Cause in my mind it was just like the worst thing that happens is those links just 404 and it's like, Nope. Uh, these clients think that these are all brand new records. So, yeah. Um, this brings up a good question of like, you know, and this is a project that's just you, right? Um, for development. Yeah. Yeah. It's one I, I inherited. Yeah. Uh, well, I just got thinking about like, these are the situations when in the team environment, you need to be able to propagate that learning to everybody. And I think like the checklist thing is good and a nice way of sort of like, okay, you learned this the hard way um, and you're going to feel that way about this and be very, very careful. But that, it doesn't mean that everybody else will on the team you know, and so if there were other people adding that step to the checklist to, you know, deploy it to staging, then check these things and make sure that this uh, feed hasn't changed or there's no nulls or whatever. Um, those things can probably be a good way of, you know, getting that to other team members and like sharing the importance of it because you're going to feel it emotionally and they won't quite feel it the same away and that's that's definitely a hard thing to do with building software with teams is being able to share that with everybody and you know you can write a post about it in slack or an email or whatever but it's just not going to ring near as true with everybody and so the checklist thing seems like a good way to like enforce it as opposed to just saying you know or having a meeting and talking about let's not do this anymore that's a way to like enforce that it happens the right way for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, um, well, yeah, survive. you've, you've lived to have another day. <laughs> yeah. And, um, they still oh. work with me. So that's, yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say, what was the final outcome? Like, how are the clients feeling about that and everything? I mean, nobody's happy. It happens. Sure. Um, <laughs> but we, I mean, you know, we tried to fix it as quick as we could. You know, the damage was done. And so our, our next step is, you know, putting in kind of checks and balances to try and mitigate something like this happening again. But um, they want me to help with that and continue on. So cool. So everything ended up pretty good and um, it, as good as it could have ended in this situation. Yeah. Well, that's good then. So at least it had a. Not a not quite a happy ending, but it had yeah. an ending. <laughs> yes, and it it didn't end with um, a severed relationship, which was I don't know. As weird as it sounds, that's really the thing I was most concerned about. Is mm -hmm. I just didn't want to, you know, accidents mistakes happen, but I didn't want my mistake to sever yeah, a really good relationship with people I've had for a while. So yeah, and I I don't think you know. A lot of times when you hear those stories of somebody got fired because they dropped the production database or something, like it was never a good reason to fire somebody, you know, like people make mistakes and it's probably more of a, a problem with your process than it is with that person, you know, unless they intentionally did it or something like that's not a fire. It shouldn't be a fireable offense. It should be, okay, well, we need to work on our process better and make sure that this can't happen again for anyone you know, and cause it's, it was genuinely a mistake as long as that was the case, you know, I don't see those, I don't see a good reason why I would want to fire someone for making a mistake like that, unless it was something no one could ever recover from or something, I, you know? I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. And I don't know if I, like I mentioned, this isn't my day job. This is uh, <laughs> my only side project I have now or my only air quotes freelance client I have. So, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's the one when I, when I cut out all my other freelancers, it's like the one I wanted to keep. So I was like, you know, yeah. Yeah. Other than that though, good week. I did like five or six videos on like ES6 fundamentals for react. 
I saw those up on YouTube. People have to check those out. Yeah, it it was very draining. Of course, I also tried to like knock them all out in one day. Um, yeah, that's definitely draining. Any, it's funny. Like anytime I do a screencast, um, I'll record usually in the mornings, and then by the time that I'm done recording, I can't do anything the rest of the day. Like mentally, it's just I am dead. <laughs> so actually. It was about 30 minutes after I finished the last one when uh, Feedgate happened. <laughs> oh, man. That's like straight injection of adrenaline at that point. <laughs> uh, so that was cool. And then I built – last night I bundled it up for the first beta. I built um, an, a mobile app right now only for iOS. But we talked about it a long time ago. It's a, a mobile app for cigar smokers. Sounds awesome. So what'd you build it in? Uh, React Native. Okay. Uh, I use Jeez. Expo. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. I've I've tried to do React Native without Expo. Expo is like, I was actually thinking about this today. Using Expo is kind of like that feeling of using Rails where like you just get stuff out of the box. Mm-hmm. And like, it's easy to get started. Like I just, I use Create React Native app. I ran that command. And then I just like, I had an app. Oh, cool. Yeah. So that was nice. And then, um, so it's real super beta. It's just a feed. You can like post, you can post your own, but it's just literally like a cigar name and an image. And then you can log out. (laughs) So was that powered by rails API or like a Firebase thing or it's a rails API. I considered Firebase. Um, but I had tried a Firebase API in the past on an app I never launched and Re- Firebase will work with React Native for the most part. But like if you hit a wall, like you hit a wall hard with Firebase. Hmm. And so like with Rails API, like just building a Rails API, I was in control of everything. So like uh, I put active storage in, like I had some problems with it, but I was able to figure out my problems because I was in control. So Gotcha. Yeah. Interesting. Um, that's, I've never used Firebase. Who, who acquired Firebase? Was it Google? Google. Yeah. Google. yeah. Interesting. They always have funny, uh, APIs at Google, but maybe because it was Firebase first, it, it's less odd. <laughs> Firebase, the promise of it is so awesome. Like, I really wanted to use Firebase, but what I got stuck with last time is that specifically like using React Native or Expo with Firebase, I was trying to upload an image as Base64 and um, Google Cloud Storage would reject it. Hmm. And so... Do do they not support Base64 or something else? There's something about some kind of encoding. I think it's haywired somewhere. And like, um, so I, if I remember correctly, like on Expo's website, they have a section on Firebase. And I think it even says like right now, this doesn't work with Google storage. And that was like seven or eight months ago. I tried to do that. So <laughs> I just, I didn't want to get like to the end of the app and then be like, what? And like it's stuck. So Yeah. Two Google products don't talk to each other. Great. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so um yeah that sounds yeah i think the rails api is probably a good idea then and you know that in and out so you can build that fast yeah i just threw like active model serializer in i wanted to use fast json or whatever it's called by netflix oh yeah right but it is a. Uh, i'm gonna get judged so hard for this so it seems to strictly implement the json json api spec and i don't know that super well and didn't really want to try and learn it right then. Whereas sure. like yeah, AMS, yeah. I can just like set attributes and render JSON. So. Yep. Yeah. You don't want to, I mean, it's, it's your app needs to be live first before you worry about how perfect your, you know, JSON format is and stuff. Like it's more important for you to have the app shipped. Um, yeah. And JSON API is cool for a lot of reasons. Um, uh, for like efficiency um, because you can kind of say what you want to include and what you don't, but you know, it's, it requires a lot more handling of things 
in your JavaScript because then you got to go look up, okay, well, it referenced this thing, but it's in a whole other location rather than just right here. And that gets kind of annoying and you have to do a lot more processing for that stuff. But it's the trade-off for efficiency client side, I guess. But yeah, you know, I it's, re- it's, uh, that's something I need to cover um, on GoRail sometime is that past JSON. And uh, I think Acumodal, that's actually a good point is uh, ActiModel Serializers has the JSON API style that you could use. Um, so you could potentially switch to that at some point and then just flip the switch and go over to the uh, Netflix one. Kind of cool. So it just got really choppy. Oh, weird. Well, um, is it better now? I think so. This might be the only problem we have recording over a Google Hangout. Yeah, I think this happens semi-regularly. Do you, uh, I tell you what, why don't you, why don't we turn off our camera and see if that helps? Okay. All right, how's that? Much better. Cool. Well, we will roll true podcast style now. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so that was, um, I really had a lot of fun with React Native. I really like modern, air quotes, JavaScript. Uh, I really like doing JavaScript in VS Code. I really liked, um, right now I have the app, I bundled it as an iOS app and I have it, I'm not trying to submit to the app store, but I'm trying to submit it to test flight, which is Apple's like way to have people beta test your app. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping to get that out soon and just see what it's like. But, and you can even, because you're using Expo and you're not probably, um, using any uh, things that you can, you can share it through the Expo client on iOS with anybody else who has Expo, right? Right. Um, the cool thing about, maybe it does it with Expo. I haven't, I haven't done that a ton, but the cool thing about test flight is like you send them a link and then they download like it downloads, it takes them to test flight and then it just installs the app, I think. Um, yeah, it's like a real iOS app that way. Yeah, and so I thought that was cool because Expo, like you download the Expo app and then you can just open the app in, in Expo. Yeah, it's not it's not quite as nice because it's a little bit faked, but it is a way to do it without even have to go through the whole test flight process, which is kind of nice. Yeah. So yeah, that was uh, a little bit of redemption. And then I launched uh, a new feature for Podia this week. We take payment plans now. So I saw that. I didn't even know that was on the uh, list of things to do. That's going to be great because, I mean, any large priced course is payment plan um, central. You know, you were, you're, if you're going to sell a $2,000 course, you probably don't want to have to force everybody to write you a two thousand dollar check right away. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's a thing I got to work on, and that launched quietly yesterday, and then they had an announcement today. So I mean, there's there's a couple little kinks here and there, but for the most part, it was really smooth, and it just it felt good to put something into the world that people wanted. So yeah, that's fantastic. That's the first big uh, feature that you've shipped on the new job. It is. I've done just, uh, well, my first big feature was GDPR <laughs> compliance. Uh, <yay. laughs> my first my first feature that like people actually cared about uh, was this one. So Yeah, GDPR was less of a feature. It was just kind of forced upon us all. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was fun. What happens with uh, your customers if they're on a payment plan and they um, mysteriously stop paying in the middle of uh, things. Do they lose access, or how does that work? Uh, there's a there is a grace period, and then mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it will shut off access until things get sorted out. Gotcha. Is there any weirdness that you have to do if they never do that? If they never finish paying, or it's just uh, not fine to leave them at where they were. Um, I think that's going to be more on like a creator basis. 
So right now I think it's, you know, just cut them off. <laughs> but, yeah. And just let it, let it be. Yeah. So, but yeah, that, that's been fun. That was, there are some technical challenges there, which was good for the old, the old noggin. So, mm-hmm. What about you? You shouldn't have used the pay gem you're working on. <laughs> oh, working on. Yeah, <laughs> Look, I haven't touched it either for a long time. <laughs> looking at it in GitHub. If you want to work on a gym, pay, P-A-Y, Jason, github.com, Jason Charns, pay. It is subscription, Stripe, code. And Braintree. Oh, yeah. Did we finish that? Uh, I think I got a pretty good... You want to say, um, I mean, did you finish Braintree? I think I got a pretty good um, amount of that done. There's just like weird things with Braintree because like you can't switch from a monthly plan to a yearly plan. You have to cancel and then subscribe on a new plan to do that change. And there's, you got to manually do the proration and all that crap. So um, there were a few things like that that were just like, uh, I don't want to do this. Why can't the like that's you know that's a great point of uh, an API that's not good, you know those features should not be like forced upon your customers like that's not hard for them to go implement for everybody because um, Stripe's doing it just fine and has done that for as long as I can remember and uh, you know it's just a an extra amount of work that your customers shouldn't have to do. And that's, you know, common things like that should always be kind of automated inside of your your code um, if you are the one selling them the service, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Braintree has always been a nightmare to work with. Yeah. I know GitHub's used them from almost the very, very beginning, I think. There's a lot of big companies that have used them. I think they had, you know. Uh, well, they may have been around before Stripe. I'm pretty sure they were actually. Yeah, so. I'm pretty sure they were. It's just like for every one step in Stripe, it's two to three steps. In, two to three steps in Braintree. It feels like. Yeah, and it's probably not going to get a whole lot better, just given that it's PayPal now. So yeah. they haven't. They've been notoriously bad about any documentation and all of the PayPal express APIs and stuff are just impossible to really read through it. Like just wrap your head around They're They're rough. Um, maybe they'll get around to pulling the, the old Microsoft move and getting good at, at uh, open source and things, but who knows? Um, yeah, actually uh, you mentioned uh, Expo earlier. I've been fiddling with it uh, a bit again this week myself. Um, I was doing, so I've got this other project that I'm working on that I, I've told a few people about, but basically I'm going to bring video um, stuff to like customer support. And I've been working on building an app um, that allows you to like run tickets and stuff with your customers, but kind of the default response type will be recording a video or audio. And then text will kind of be, you'll have uh, transcripts from that that can get included, but you know, they, it encourages your customers to see your face and to have a better sort of relationship with them. Um, so I'm experimenting with that, but one of the big things with that is I want to have a mobile app so that mobile is just a really good thing to uh, record on. And it, I don't know, videos when you record it on your phone, like selfie or Snapchat style, um, tend to look a lot better than your webcam on your computer which is usually in a weird angle. And so I want I want to have a mobile app and Expo is going to be a good way to get that all rolling. And um, pretty soon I'm going to have a couple screencasts on that because um, Doorkeeper is, I, I meant to ask you what how you were doing authentication for your API, but Doorkeeper is what I implemented and that provides an OAuth provider for your application. So then you can... Um, do the OAuth process from, say, your mobile app or any other app that wants to integrate, and then it will generate your JWT tokens um, and provide auth. And then it also um, really easily integrates with Devise. So I've implemented that in my Rails app, and then uh, you can access the API through that in Expo. 
actually has some built-in OAuth stuff. So you just drop in the URL uh, to your application to log in and the authorized path or the standard OAuth uh, routes for authentication. And then you get your token back and uh, it basically is handled through exponents or expo, I guess is what they're called now. Um, it goes through their service thing and then it goes to your login page and then the approve page and then back to expo, which gives your, uh, your React Native app the token and then you can access the API and everything. And I, w- I definitely want to cover that process sometime soon. Nice. Yeah, I'm not doing any OAuth yet. I just wanted to keep it as basic as I could. So I'm actually using Knock with JSON Web Tokens. Cool. Yeah, that one works great. Yeah, there's um, I'm using a node module, a node package. I don't know the proper term because I live in Ruby land <laughs> that is React Native Navigation. And the, we'll see, because React Navigation is, or the website I know is React Navigation, the modern one. The, um, I think the package is the React Native Navigation. Their naming for their navigation stuff has been uh, horrendous. Yeah. No, the package is called React Navigation now. So it might be a different one than the one that... Oh, no, 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 no. I'm talking what you're talking about, reactnavigation.org? Uh, yes. Yeah. I, uh, I think React Native Navigation is something else. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's something that Wix does. So oh, React right. Navigation is what I use, and they've got a whole section on authentication flows. Yes. Yeah, I remember this. And I so think that's I, what I implemented, too, or similar. I was trying to like do it myself and then I learned about this switch navigator, which will essentially like switch you between whether you need to be in the app authentication or like a loading screen. And when I put that in, like my app just clicked. That's cool. I, I actually, this looks newer than last I remember, or a lot of this stuff has changed too because the API changed from, you know, have this create switch navigator, create stack navigator. And it's a hard time for me to wrap my head around the navigation stuff. I've not really liked the the flow or whatever of all this. It just seems to be overly complicated. I don't know if you've felt that too or what um, coming from Rails. It's, it's complicated, I find it a little less complicated than trying to do this all with like Swift or Objective C. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like the hardest part was React navigation has tab navigation and then like um, navigator, which is like back buttons and stuff. And I really, I needed like a combination of all three. Mm -hmm. So like my app is an app stack which is like a stack navigator, which actually contains tab navigation, which then actually renders my components. So. Yeah. And um, that stuff gets complicated because I've like looked at similar to like Slack's UI on mobile where you have uh, the main, um, the main screen, which doesn't really have the tabs or anything, but it has the drawer navigation on the left side. But then there's like, a carousel built into the drawer as well. And, you know, when you go to the settings, it takes over the screen and as like a pop-up uh, navigation. And um, that stuff is a little bit hard to replicate still. Um, it feels like it should be a little bit easier conceptually, but the, I think I, when I originally was using this, I was using React Navigation version one. There's a lot of weirdness to stuff. And there was, I remember looking at some of the docs and it, or the issues on GitHub and it was like, you can't pop back like two pages or whatever. And that's what I was trying to do. Like do a little bit of a wizard to create a video, review it, then upload it and then go back to two or three screens off the stack. And uh, yeah, like at the time there wasn't really anything to allow you to do that. And I think they've improved it quite a bit. 
Um, but it was just funny to see that. Like, seems like a common feature. <laughs> yeah. So, Ooh, anything else going on? Anything else exciting? Oh, um, I recorded a, a video on you know converting Heroku app over to Hatchbox, which was kind of fun and um, probably something I should have done like a year ago. But you know, the main migration there just is. For the most part, just deploy your app to your own server and then uh, export your database and import it on your server on Hatchbox. And um, it was nice to have that done and and sort of I want to build out more of that stuff. But um, it's been forcing me into learning a lot more design stuff. So I've been really enjoying Steve Shoger's design videos on YouTube on refactoring UI. Those are pretty killer. Have you seen any trials or signups since you put that video up? Uh, well, it was in Rupee Weekly today. Um, so I imagine that, well, I've actually got a couple emails from people that I'm almost certain came from that. Um, so that's that's good. I haven't really done any specific tracking on it. And I just published that video last week, I think. So um, I'll have to take a look and see how it's been growing. I kind of roughly know the you know, the average number of signups on a regular day, but um, I imagine it's higher over this past week or especially today when it goes out on Ruby Weekly. So be interesting to see, and I'll probably be able to report back on that uh, next episode or something. You have to remind me to look into that before we record next one. Awesome. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear that. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be fun to see for sure because... Um, you know, Roku gets expensive fast. And if you're hosting a side project or something, um, it can be equally time consuming um, to, you know, host it yourself and set up your server and keep an eye on all that. So it's in theory, well, at least for my side projects and everything that I'm hosting on there, it's been hugely time saving to uh, just be able to have it all managed from, from there, but only hosted on a $5 server instead of uh you know, a probably at least 60 bucks a month or something on Heroku with by the time you pay for Elasticsearch or Redis or Postgres or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So, well, um, anything else? That's, uh, that's all I've got. I mean, I feel like I talked about all my problems most of this episode, but. No, this is yeah. good. That's episode number two on therapy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so well awesome if uh if you enjoyed this and or the last episode and would like this to continue on please let us know also um i didn't hear anything last time for anybody about the link to the format but we're still open to suggestion and ideas on that yep officially we now have uh what an apple feed and everything uh where we didn't last time right yeah, we've got Apple Podcasts, Google Play. Uh, we should be in the Overcast directory now. We have a Pocket Cast URL. And then also just podcast.remoteruby.net will list all the episodes and give you a feed. Fantastic. Well, all right. Well, we'll do this again next week. All right. Sounds good. Have a good week, everybody. Bye. <laughs>